Elections The election process lies at the very heart of the democratic concept. Indeed, it is impossible to picture a democratic government in which popular elections are not held. Here are terms that you'll hear throughout this lesson, absentee voting, coattail effect, precinct, polling place, and ballot. Many high school students are not old enough to vote. In some parts of the country, however, high school students can serve on local election boards. First in Hawaii and Oregon, and now in several states, 16 and 17 year olds can become full-fledged members of the panels that administer elections. Americans hold more elections and vote more often than most people realize. Indeed, Sundays and holidays are about the only days of the year in which people do not go to the polls somewhere in the United States. Americans also elect far more office holders than most people realize. In fact, more than 500,000 of them. Obviously, the election of public officials is very serious business. In this lesson, you'll learn about the federal and state laws that seek to ensure the integrity of this vital process. English novelist H.G. Wells once called elections, democracies feast its great function. Democratic government cannot succeed, however, unless elections are free, honest, and accurate. Most people look at the details of the election process as too complicated, too legalistic, too dry and boring to worry about. Those people miss the vital part of such details that play in making democracy work. Recall, you saw how important the details of election law can be when we looked at voter qualifications and voter registration in the last lesson and again just a few pages ago when you considered the complexities of the direct primary nearly all elections in the united states are held to choose people to fill offices at state and local levels given this fact it is quite understandable that most election law in the united states is state law despite this fact a body of federal election law does exist the Constitution gives Congress the power to fix, quote, the times, places, and manner of holding elections, end quote, of members of Congress. Congress also has the power to set the time for choosing presidential electors, to set the date for casting electoral votes, and to regulate other aspects of the presidential election process. Congress has set the date for holding congressional elections as the first Tuesday following the first Monday in November of every even-numbered year. It is set the same date every fourth year for the presidential election. Thus, the, the next off-year congressional election will be held in 2018. The next presidential election, of course, is happening in 2016. Congress has required the use of secret ballots and allowed the use of voting machines to, uh, in federal elections. It has passed several laws to protect the right to vote in all elections. Congress has also prohibited various corrupt practices and regulated the financing of campaigns for federal office. State laws deal with other matters relating to national elections. State law also covers all the details involved in choosing the thousands of state and local officials. Most states hold their elections to fill state offices on the same date Congress has set for national elections, in November of every even-numbered year. The Tuesday after the first Monday formula prevents election day from falling on Sundays to maintain the principle of separation of church and state. This formula also prevents election from falling on the first day of the month, which is often payday and therefore potentially subject to campaign pressures. Some states do fix other dates for some offices. Louisiana, Mississippi, New Jersey, and Virginia elect the governor, other elect executive offices, and state legislators in November of odd-numbered years. City, county, and other local election dates vary from state to state. When those elections are not held in November, they generally take place in the spring.
Most states take provision for absentee voting, or voting by those unable to get to their regular polling place on election day. Absentee voting laws usually cover three groups of potential voters. One, those too ill or disabled to make it to their polling places. Two, those who are expected to be away from home on election day, such as on a business trip, away at college, or on vacation. And three, those serving in the armed forces. Voters can apply for an absentee ballot within a specified period before an election. They then mark that ballot, seal it, and return it to the proper local election official. Another form of early voting has spread among the states in recent years. In an effort to make voting more convenient and increase voter turnout, a third of the states now allow voters to cast ballots over a period of several days before an election. Not as absentee ballots, but as though they were voting on election day itself. Texas has the most liberal of these early voting laws. There, any registered voter can cast his or her ballot up to 17 days before any primary or general election. The coattail effect occurs when a strong candidate running for an office at the top of the ballot helps attract voters to other candidates on the party's ticket. In effect, the lesser-known office seekers ride the coattails of the more prestigious personalities. In 1980 and 1984, for example, Ronald Reagan's coattails helped many Republican candidates win office. The coattail effect is usually most apparent in presidential elections. However, a popular candidate for senator or governor can have the same kind of pulling power. A reverse coattail effect can occur too. This happens when a candidate has, for high office is less than popular with many voters. For example, Barry Goldwater as the Republican presidential nominee in 1964 and George McGovern for the Democrats in 1972. President Carter's coattails were also of the reverse variety in 1980. Some people argue that all state and local elections should be held on dates other than those set for federal elections. This, they say, would help voters pay more attention to state and local candidates and issues. At the same time, it would lessen the coattail effects of presidential contests. A precinct is a voting district. Precincts are the smallest geographic units for conducting elections. State law regularly restricts their size, generally to an area with no more than 500 to 1,000 or so qualified voters. A polling place, the place where the voters who live in a precinct actually vote, is located somewhere in or near each precinct. A precinct election board supervises the polling place and voting processes in each precinct. Typically, the county clerk or county board of elections draw pre uh, precinct lines, fixes the location of each polling place, and picks the number of precinct boards. The precinct board opened and closed the polls at the time set by state law. In most states, the polls are open from 7 or 8 a.m. to 7 or 8 p.m. The precinct election board must also see that the ballots in the ballot boxes or voting machines are available. They must make certain that only qualified voters cast ballots in the precinct. Often the board also counts the votes cast in the precinct and then sends the results to the proper place, usually to the county clerk or county board of electors. Poll watchers, one for each party, are allowed at each polling place. They may challenge any person that seeks, that believes is not qualified to vote check to be sure that their own party's supporters do vote, and monitor the whole process, including the counting of the ballots. A ballot is the device by which a voter registers a choice in an election. It can take a number of different forms. Whatever its form, however, it is clear and clearly an important and sensitive part of the election process. Each state now provides for a secret ballot. That is, state law requires that ballots be cast in such manner that others cannot know how a person has voted. Voting was a public process through much of the nation's earlier history, however. Paper ballots were used in some colonial elections, but voting was more commonly viva voce, by voice. 
Voters simply stated their choices to an election board. With suffrage limited to the privileged few, many people defined, defended oral voting as the only manly way in which to participate. Whatever the merits of that view, the expansion of the electorate brought with it a marked increase in intimidation, vote buying, and other corruptions of the voting process. Paper ballots were in general use by the mid-1800s. The first ones were unofficial, slips of paper that voters prepared themselves and dropped in the, the, the ballot box. Soon candidates and parties began to prepare ballots and hand them to voters to cast, sometimes paying them to do so. Those party ballots were often printed on distinctly colored paper, and anyone watching could tell from whom voters were voting. By the end of the 1800s, political machines, local party um, organizations capable of mobilizing or manufacturing large numbers of votes on behalf of candidates for political office, were dominant in many places. They fought all attempts to make voting a more dependably fair and honest process. The political corruption of the post-Civil War years brought widespread demand for ballot reforms. The Australian Ballot A new voting arrangement was devised in Australia where it was first used in an election in Victoria in 1856. Its success there led to its use in many other countries. By 1900 nearly all the states were using it. It remains the basic form of the ballot throughout the United States today. The Australian ballot has four essential features. One, it is printed at public expense. Two, it lists the names of all candidates in an election. Three, it is given out only at the polls, one to each qualified voter. And four, it is marked in secret. Two basic varieties of the Australian ballot have developed over the years. Nearly half the states now use the office group version. The rest of the states use the party column ballot. The office group ballot. The office group ballot is the original form of the Australian ballot. It also sometimes called the Massachusetts ballot because of its early 1888 use there. On the office group ballot, the candidates for an office are grouped together under the title of that office. Because the names of the candidates thus appear as a block, the form is also sometimes called the office block ballot. At first the names of the candidates were listed in alphabetical order. Most states using the form now rotate the names. This is so that each candidate will have whatever psychological advantage there may be in having his or her name at the top of the list of candidates. The Party Column Ballot The Party Column Ballot is also known as the Indiana Ballot from its early 1889 use in that state. It lists each party's candidates in a column under the party's name. Often there is a place at the top of the column where, for with a single X, the voter can vote for all that party's elections. Professional politicians tend to favor the party column ballot. It encourages straight ticket voting, especially in the party if the party has a strong candidate at the head of the ticket. Most students of the political process favor the office group form because it encourages voter judgment and split ticket voting. Sample ballots. Sample ballots clearly marked as such, are available in most states before an election. In some states they are mailed to all voters and they appear in most newspapers. They cannot be cast, but they can help the voters prepare for an election. First in Oregon in 1907 and now in several states, an official voters pamphlet is mailed to voters before every election. It lists all candidates and measures that will appear on the ballot. In Oregon, each candidate is allowed space to present his or her qualifications and positions on the issues. Supporters and opponents of ballot measures are allowed space to present their arguments as well. Bedsheet Ballots The ballot in a typical American election is lengthy, often inaptly called a bedsheet ballot. It frequently lists so many offices, candidates, and ballot measures that even the most well-informed voters have a difficult time making it intelligently. The long ballot came to American politics in the era of, in the era of Jacksonian democracy in the 1830s. Many held the view at the time that the greater the number of elective offices, the more democratic the governmental system. 
the idea remains widely accepted today. Generally, the longest ballots are found at the local level, especially among the nation's 3,000-odd counties. The list of elected officials may include several commissioners, a clerk, a sheriff, one or more judges, a prosecutor, coroner, treasurer, assessor, surveyor, school superintendent, engineer, sanitarian, and even the proverbial dog catcher. Critics of the long ballot do not accept the argument that the more people you elect, the more democratic you are. They believe that quite the reverse is true. With a smaller number of elected officials' offices to fill, the voter can better know the candidate and their qualifications. Critics also point to ballot fatigue. This refers to the drop-off voting that can run as high as 20 to 30 percent at or near the bottom of a typical bedsheet ballot. There seems little, if any, good reason to elect such local officials as clerks, coroners, and surveyors, engineers, and such. Their jobs do not carry policy-making responsibilities. Rather, they carry out policies made by others. Many people believe that in order to shorten the ballot and save money, the rule should be elected, elect those who make public policies, but appoint those whose job it is to administer those policies. Voting Machines and Innovations Thomas Edison took out the first American patent for a voting machine. The community of Lockport, New York first used the invention in 1892. The use of similar devices has long since spread to the polling places of every state. Only a few states make the use of voting machines mandatory. Most often, the machines are used only in some areas of a state, usually the more populous. All told, however, over half of all the votes in nationwide elections today are cast in some form on voting machines. The typical voting machine serves as its own booth. By pulling a lever, the voter encloses himself or herself within a three-sided curtain, and the machine itself becomes the fourth side of the voting booth. Pulling the lever also unlocks the voting machine. The ballot appears on the face of the machine, and the voter makes choices by pulling down the small levers over the names of the candidate he or she favors. The machine also has space for ballot measures and yes-no levers for each of them. In most states that use the party column ballot, the voter can pull a master lever to vote straight ticket. The machine is programmed so that a voter can cast only one vote per contest. Once all levers are in the desired positions, the voter opens the curtain. That action records the votes and at the same time clears the machine for the next voter. Voting machines do away with the need for manual vote counting, reduce the number of people needed to administer elections, and speed the voting process. They also increase the number of voters who can be handled per, uh, per precinct and make ballot mutilation impossible and, minimi and minimize fraud and, and counting errors. Electronic vote counting. Electronic data processing techniques were first applied to the voting process in the 1960s. California, California and Oregon began the trend, and since then more than two-thirds of the states have followed suit to some degree. The most widely used adaptation of EDP in elections includes punch card ba ballots, which are counted by computers. Many states and localities are now turning to other EDP-based voting processes. One involves paper ballots that are counted by optical scanners. The other is a touchscreen system that we use here in Harris and Galveston County. Vote by mail elections. A number of states conduct some elections by mail. Voters receive a ballot in the mail, make their choices, then mail the ballot back to election officials. The first vote-by-mail election was held in Monterey County, California in 1977, and the first scale use of mail-in ballots took place in San Diego in 1981. Vote-by-mail elections are now held in several other places. Usually vote-by-mail elections have been confined to the local level and to voting on city or county measures, not on candidates for local offices. A few states do choose local offices by mail-in ballots, however. In fact, Oregon now holds all of its elections by mail and has done so since 1998. 
the state held the first ever male all male primary election, including the presidential election, and the first ever all uh, all male general election in 2000. Vote by mail elections have stirred growing controversy. Critics fear that the process threatens the principle of the secret ballot. They worry about fraud, especially the possibility that some voters may be subject to undue pressures when they mark their ballot at home or any place other than within the security of a voting booth. Supporters, on the other hand, say the vote-by-mail elections can be as fraud-proof as, as any other method of voting. They also cite this fact. The mail-in process increases voter turnout in elections and at the same time reduces the cost of conducting them. Online voting, e-voting, or casting ballots on the internet will likely become widespread, perhaps even commonplace. Several states are now moving in that direction. Online voting has many of the same advantages and disadvantages as voting by mail. Online voting is not an entirely new phenomenon. The first e-vote was cast in November 1997. In that year, election officials in Harris County, Texas, permitted astronaut David Wolf to vote in Houston's city election by email from the space station Mir. The nation's first public election in which voters cast their ballots online was held in Arizona in March of 2000. The Arizona Democratic Party allowed voters to participate in the party's presidential primary by voting one in person at their precinct polling places, two by mail, or three via the internet. The Defense Department also conducted a limited online voting project in November 2000. In that test program, some 250 members of the military who were stationed abroad cast votes in their home states by computer. A number of public officials in several states and a number of dot-com companies promote online voting. These supporters claim that it will make participation much more convenient, increase voter turnout, and reduce the cost of conducting elections. Many skeptics believe that electronic infrastructure is not ready for e-voting. Some fear digital disaster, jamming, of internet lines, blocked access, hackers, viruses, denials of service attacks, fraudulent vote counts, and violations of voter secrecy. Critics also point out that because not, anyone, not everyone can afford home computers, online voting could undermine basic American principles of equality.